Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Breaking news this hour, the Senate has confirmed Congresswoman Deb Holland as the first Native American cabinet secretary in US history. She will be Joe Biden's interior secretary and she will oversee the federal government's relationship with more than 500 tribal nations and nearly 2 million indigenous Americans and Alaskan natives. File that under big deal. It is. Also tonight, have you heard the one about the accused neo-Nazi with government security clearance. That would be Timothy Hale Cusinelli, an enlisted army reservist who worked for the past two years as a security contractor at a Navy weapons facility in New Jersey. In recently filed court documents, his supervisor says Hale Cusinelli was a Nazi sympathizer and Holocaust denier who regularly asked co-workers, you're not Jewish, are you? He also hosted a YouTube show calling for a civil war and collected racist memes that are too disturbing to share with you on this show. An ongoing criminal investigation also found co-workers shared their discomfort when Hale Cusinelli showed up to work sporting a Hitler-style moustache. In fact, he took proud selfies with that moustache on April 21st last year, the day after Hitler's birthday. 34 of his co-workers described him as having extremist or radical views pertaining to the Jewish people, minorities and women. Several sailors at the base said Hale Cusinelli had told them that, quote, Hitler should have finished the job. And everyone just put up with it until he stormed the Capitol on January the 6th. Federal agents arrested him the week after the insurrection and only in the ensuing investigation did Hale Cusinelli's co-workers open up to authorities about his white supremacist ideology. His attorney told the court, quote, there is no evidence Mr. Hale Cusinelli is a member of any white supremacist organizations. That's so strange. An accused neo-Nazi involved in the insurrection. Republicans like Senator Ron Johnson have told us that the January 6th rioters were, quote, people that love this country, that truly respect law enforcement, would never do anything to break a law. This is what white privilege looks like. I can't stop thinking about what would happen to a brown-skinned Muslim who ranted about killing Jews, women and minorities in the workplace. I doubt he would have stayed off of police radars for so long, let alone kept his job. But maybe it's a one-off, right? Maybe not. On Sunday, the New York Times published an investigation showing that police have long looked the other way from violent right-wing extremist groups like the Proud Boys. The story points out that two Proud Boys who were arrested for their role in the January 6th insurrection had successfully evaded arrest before with law enforcement help. Yeah. One of those men, Joseph Biggs, assaulted a protester outside the 2016 Republican convention. But only the protester was arrested in that case. Authorities paid a quarter of a million dollars to settle accusations that police had falsified their reports to favor Biggs. Yeah, Biggs of the Proud Boys. That was just months before a group of pr other Proud Boys assaulted protesters outside a Manhattan Republican club. And none were initially arrested, spurring Proud Boys founder Gavin McInnes to boast, quote, I have a lot of support in the NYPD, and I very much appreciate that. The boys in blue. It wasn't just elements of law enforcement, though, who thought the Proud Boys were okay. So did their commander-in-chief. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacist and right like me to condemn? White Proud Boys. White supremacist and right Proud, Proud Boys. Boys, stand back and stand by. All of this comes as we now learn that a family member of accused capital insurrectionist and 3% militiaman, Guy Refit, had called the FBI in December to warn that Refit was, quote, going to do some serious damage to lawmakers in Washington. But he wasn't arrested until after the insurrection when his son tipped off the cops. We've reported before at length on this show on the infiltration of law enforcement and military ranks by far-right groups such as these. As a nation, we now have two interlinked problems. We have a problem of far-right domestic terrorism, and we have a law enforcement establishment that hasn't taken it seriously enough, partly because some of its members are sympathetic to those far-right ideologies. But let's also be clear, law enforcement is a target of the violence too. The Justice Department today announced charges against two men in the assault on Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, who died the next day. Feds say those men carried weapons, including tire irons, sledgehammers, bear spray and tasers. All of this leaves one to wonder just how much of an ongoing threat is the American far right and how well prepared and how willing are police and prosecutors to tackle it. Joining me now is Andy Campbell, HuffPost senior editor, who's currently at work on Proud, a book about the Proud Boys and the rise of the far right. Uh, Andy, thanks so much for coming on the show. You're literally writing the book 
on the Proud Boys. Explain to us, why did they get a pass from police as often as they did? And do you see that changing at all now? Well, the Proud Boys have long positioned themselves uh, as, you know, a patriotic uh, arm of the GOP, the ones who are willing to go against their, you know, the socialist threat that they've created um, and, you know, willing to fight them in the street. And so they've they've kind of become attractive to law enforcement uh, who stand beside them at rallies. You know, we've seen the law enforcement stand next to them and often escort them to and from their events. And, and so they've long created them as, as themselves as attractive to law enforcement and certainly uh, claim law enforcement in their own ranks. So they've always been, you know, in the orbit of law enforcement and certainly, as you said, the, the, the GOP. And how dangerous are groups like the Proud Boys in particular? Because there was some discussion back in the day about, well, they're just people who involve, in, involve themselves in street violence. But now we're talking about involvement in a domestic terror attack, to quote the FBI director. Right, Mehdi. I mean, the DHS said something like they're guys that drink too much after the football game and tend to get into bar fights. But the idea that they didn't recognize the threat the Proud Boys pose is either a lie or reveals gross incompetence on the part of law enforcement. We've been raising the alarm about the Proud Boys and other extremist gangs as reporters in the field uh, since they were founded amid Trump's election campaign back in 2016. Since then, they've uh, committed and planned some of the worst extremist events uh, in American history, including Unite the Right in Charlottesville, uh, planned and executed by a yes. Proud Boy. Uh, and, you know, in, 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 of course, January 6th, a Proud Boy was one of the first people through the doors there. So they're a huge threat, not only for the things that they do in the field, but for the groups of people they're able to bring together under one banner to come to these events and attack. Yes. A very good point about the bringing together. Uh, Ten days ago, your colleagues Ryan Riley and Jessalyn Cook tracked down and interviewed a Capitol insurrectionist who had charged police with a fire extinguisher and hadn't been arrested yet. That story quoted tipsters as saying they didn't know if anything they told the FBI was being followed up on. Meanwhile, the DC pipe bomber has yet to be found. Uh, all this as the FBI continues to say it didn't see any rising signs of violence before January the 6th when all they had to do was log on to Twitter. Why does law enforcement seem to be so bad at this? Well, I mean, law enforcement has long not, uh, you know, been unable to recognize the threat. Like I said, we've been covering this for years and we've seen police stand aside them. Uh, but, you know, these guys position themselves as the enforcement arm for the GOP and for law enforcement doing the job that they can't do themselves. And so, you know, I mean, these guys are pals. The, the, the Proud Boys are the security where the security force or counted themselves as such for Roger Stone, Andy. longtime Trump confidant. Is it as simple? Is it as simple as saying it's because they're white and police officers take threats from brown and black groups of people more seriously? I think, like you said, if BLM were on the other side of that fence, it would have been a totally different story. Yeah, I think that's easy to say. Today, uh, Andy, I should also point out to our viewers, is the second anniversary of the Christchurch mosque shootings uh, in which a white supremacist killed 51 people and hurt 40 more at two mosques in New Zealand. Uh, immediately afterward, uh, their Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, said this. Have a listen. Many of those who will have been directly affected by this shooting uh, may be migrants to New Zealand. They may even be refugees here. They have chosen to make New Zealand their home and it is their home. They are us. The person who has perpetuated this violence against us is not. They have no place in New Zealand. Her US counterpart, President Trump, when asked about that shooting, when asked about if white nationalism was a problem, uh, he said, I don't think so. Um, we're now stuck in this situation where uh, the Republican Party doesn't, not only doesn't think white nationalism is a problem, you have people like Paul Gosar speaking at white nationalist conferences, Congressman Paul Gosar. How, I mean, it's fair to say now white nationalism has been mainstreamed by one of our two major political parties. I mean, the GOP has been propping up and embracing uh, white nationalism and white nationalist violence for a very long time. Uh, you know, like you said, Gavin McGinnis, founder of the Proud Boys, was invited to the stuffy and elite Metropolitan Republican Club in Manhattan uh, to give a speech 
you know, these guys are our friends. They've been propping this stuff up. And to decry this threat is to decry their own. Trump's been doing it since Unite the Right in Charlottesville when he said there were good people on both sides. We talk about this all the time. That mentality and that speech has not stopped in the GOP. And I don't see it stopping because they are one yeah. in the same. And just before we went to air, Andy, we're almost out of time, but I have, to, I have to show this to the viewers. Capitol Police confirmed that they suspended an officer after the Washington Post obtained photos of the old uh, classic anti-Semitic text, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, near the officer's post. I mean, are you concerned by that? Are you surprised by that? Not at all. I mean, you know, we find anytime there's any sort of researchers uh, uh, drop leaks uh, uh, about, you know, telegrams from neo-Nazis and Proud Boy types, we always find that law enforcement and military personnel were within their ranks. It happens every single time. I think that the nation's uh, law enforcement entities need to audit their ranks because they're going to find a couple Nazis and a couple extremists for yeah. sure. That is a uh, depressing and possibly scary thought. But Andy Campbell, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate your insights. Ever since the insurrection, Republicans have been making bad faith overtures about who was really responsible for it. But now GOP Senator Ron Johnson is saying the quiet part out loud. I'm also criticized because I've made the comment that on January 6th, I never felt threatened. Because I didn't, and mainly because I knew that e even though those thousands of people that, that were uh, marching to the Capitol yeah. were trying to pressure people like me to vote the way they wanted me to vote, I knew those are people that love this country, that uh, truly respect law enforcement, would never do anything to, to break a law. And so I wasn't concerned. Now, had the tables been turned, Joe, this could be in trouble. Had the tables been turned and President Trump won the election, and those were tens of thousands of Black Lives Matter and Antifa protesters, I might have been a little concerned. Right, so violent white protesters against the election result don't threaten you, but nonviolent black protesters for racial justice do. Gotcha. As for that crowd respecting law enforcement, 140 police officers who were injured in the attack might disagree. But of course, that Ron Johnson is the same Ron Johnson who read this Federalist article into the congressional record. I want to start out by reading excerpts from what I thought was a very interesting eyewitness account. He wrote this piece titled, I Saw Provocateurs at the Capitol Riot on January 6th. Some obviously didn't fit in, and he describes four different types of people, plainclothes militants, agents provocateurs, fake Trump protesters, and then disciplined, uniformed column of attackers. I think these are the people that uh, probably planned this. So hold on. Either they were far-left provocateurs and fake pro-Trump protesters stoking violence, or they were real pro-Trump patriots and he felt safe. He can't have it both ways. But, you know, the truth has really concerned Ron Johnson. Joining me now is an observer who has watched the senior GOP senator from Wisconsin up close longer than I would care to, uh, Charlie Sykes. He's a former conservative radio host, editor at large of The Bulwark and an MSNBC contributor. Charlie, thanks for coming back on the show. Today, Ron Johnson is deflecting complaints that those comments are racist. Have a listen. There was nothing racial about my comments, nothing whatsoever. Yeah. Now, this isn't about race, this is about riots. I mean, white mob, I feel safe, black mob, I don't. I'm not sure how you spin that as anything other than racist. Well, this is Ron Johnson without a filter. Uh, you know, you're pointing out that it makes no sense. You can't find a logical consistency between the gaslighting um, during the Senate hearing and what he said yesterday. But, you know, I was uh, talking about this on my podcast earlier today, and I said, you know what? Um, don't be surprised when Ron Johnson goes, I can't believe you thought that was racist, because he doesn't think that it is racist. He's marinating in this world where he feels that he's able to say things like this without recognizing what he is actually saying. You know, this is kind of the, I was, uh, I was thinking about the, uh, the, the John Oliver uh, segment on, uh, on, on Tucker Carlson, the way that the sort of racism and yes. bigotry have been normalized on the right. And also uh, the, the shtick is always like, uh, is this bigoted, is this racist? And the answer was, yes, it is. But they are constantly reassuring themselves that, no, you can't possibly be racist. You can't possibly be a white nationalist. Yeah. So there you have unfiltered, 
Ron Johnson saying, I wasn't afraid of these guys because they look like the kind of guys I'd hang out with back in Oshkosh, yeah. Wisconsin. And they weren't like black people protesting police violence. That would have been scary. And he and doesn't see that it's race. And what's so interesting, you mentioned... You mentioned the way that John Oliver, uh, you know, debunked Tucker Carlson's shtick on his show last yeah. night. And one of the points I think you, you rightly touch on is this idea that you say something offensive, as Ron Johnson does, and then you get, you know, you pretend to be surprised by the reaction, and then you either uh, make money out of it, you raise money off of it, or you just get more attention as a result. It's pure kind of a combination of culture war bait, click bait. I, you know, it's only a matter of time until we get a Ron Johnson fundraising email off of this, right? And that's where I was going to go to next. Don't be surprised because then it's like they are trying to cancel me. Um, they are coming for me because I am speaking these truths. You know that they're true and the establishment is coming for me. That now has become so much of the narrative on the right. And you, you've seen it from, from folks who peddle these sort of racist narratives for a long time. Interestingly enough, uh, you know, Pat Buchanan used to always say this, you know, when he would, he would throw these things out and say, you know, I'm speaking truth and they, yes. they hate me for it and they're coming for me. And that was, that was part of his marketing thing. And back in the day, guys like Tucker Carlson recognized uh, that kind of dishonest shtick, yes. but they've all adopted it. So what, mean, what it means is that it's all going to get worse. And that, that was my takeaway. That, that Ron Johnson, you, you look at what Ron Johnson is, is doing, you look at what Tucker Carlson is doing, the normalization of this rhetoric and the refusal to recognize what it is. And I, I, I will tell you, I think that Ron Johnson sincerely, you know, sincerely believes that he didn't say anything wrong. I mean, doesn't everybody look at so, groups of, you know, people, these, these proud boys and see so patriots if, who love America? Yeah. What you're describing is, is a very Trumpian view, right? He has become a Trumpy yes. senator, one of the most Trumpy senators, even though he wasn't always yes. this way uh, back when he was elected. No. Uh, what's interesting, though, is, again, more evidence of the takeover of the party. Even after Trump has gone, the Trumpism of the party is there. You've got a new piece out where you talk about uh, how Trump's pollsters identify five tribes of Republican voters. Trump boosters, diehard Trumpers, post-Trump GOP, never Trump, and InfoWars GOP, five different groups. Who do you think will be the most dominant subgroup or tribe between now and 2024 within the party? Well, you know, I, I, this morning when I was writing about that, I was it's a little bit like the, you know, the kid is trying to find the pony in, in the big pile of manure out in the driveway. Uh, if, you, if you add together the never Trumpers and the, and the people who want to move, you know, past Trump, it's 35 percent. But that means that 65 percent of the Republican Party, even after January 6th, is completely all right with Donald Trump. Uh, the constituency that is the InfoWars GOP, these are the people who believe all the QAnon uh, conspiracy theories deep in the fever swamp. They are now a considerable constituency. I mean, it's only 10 percent. Um, but they are part of a coalition that that, you know, frankly, they can't afford to lose the fact that that while while 57 percent of Republicans say they want Trump to continue to lead the party. It's only 57%, it's not 90%. And that's, you know, that, that tracks with that result yeah. from CPAC that, that at least there are some people who are willing to move on. But, but again, after what happened on January 6th, after a half million people died because of the president's in, you know, cr uh, criminal indifference with yeah. the coronavirus, to realize that he has that strong a support in the Republican party does tell you how powerful this cult is. And this is a cult that is increasingly comfortable with this white nationalist rhetoric or willing to tolerate it. And as a result, it is moving yes. closer and closer to the, the mainstream of this party, which is a tragedy for American democracy. Yes, yeah, keyword, a huge tragedy and keyword being, as we've discussed on the show before, cult. It's not a political party anymore. It's much more a personality cult. Uh, Charlie Sykes, stick around. We're going to talk more with you uh, later in the show. Thanks so much for now. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen. And make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.